But welcome everyone to Buildings and Net Zero. This is the first of five events we're running this London Climate Action Week. Just a little bit of housekeeping as background. Um, please do make sure that your microphone is on mute while the speakers are presenting so there's not any background noise. And we would absolutely encourage you to use the chat throughout to ask um, questions. And we'll hopefully have 15 minutes at the end in which you can um, ask all of our brilliant speakers some questions. So coming up today, we have some excellent talks from the community, from Debbie, an urban partnership group, and from Brian, a local resident, about their eco journey um, and, and reducing carbon emissions on buildings. And we'll also hear from colleagues across the council to tell you a bit more about our plans. But before we get onto the talk, I'm absolutely delighted that Councillor Stephen Cowan, leader of Hammersmith and Fulham, is here with us today. So I'll begin by handing over to Councillor Cowan to welcome everyone. Hi, and um, welcome to uh, what will, I hope, be an amazing week uh, of ideas and planning and rising to the challenge of our age, which is the climate and ecological emergency. Um, about two weeks ago, I visited a friend who had uh, just had a baby. And there's something interesting about holding a newborn baby in your arms, um, because they, it's, it's not just the trust that they look at you with, and it's a sense of expectation that you have for them and their lives that might be. But in this baby's life, as in all babies and all people at the moment who will live to the end of the century, then the climate emergency is the biggest thing that will challenge the way they live, how they live, and the quality of life uh, that they will have. But it would also challenge our sense of who we are as a people and the way we care for the planet that has nurtured us and give rise to our species and civilization. So these are big challenges, so big in fact, but it might be quite hard to get your mind around how we rise to them. There are two things we have to do in the way we will rise to the challenges of the climate emergency. One will be looking at the way we live our lives and the other will be the use of science and technology. I'll start a little bit about the way we live our lives. It is upsetting that it is over 20 years that Vice former Vice President Al Gore released an uncomfortable truth. Um, but there's things in that that tell us about the scale of the challenges we have to face. Because quite clearly, we've been talking about the climate change and, and, and the emergency that presents us for a very long time. But in many ways, when you walk around, you see wood burners being installed in people's houses, and you see uh, SUVs uh, becoming even bigger over the last 20 year period. And you can see that we haven't got our message through. And in a democracy, that is the vital thing because people are essentially good. They essentially want to do the right thing, but we have to show how we can lead them to do that on the environmental front. And so we have to find ways of bringing the public with us. And that is a true internationally for the planet as it is true for a small West London council like Hammersmith and Fulham. We know that heating is one of the main ways that we're adding to uh, greenhouse gases and, and uh, contributing to climate change. And we know the way we travel around is one of the big challenges that we face. And so looking at more sustainable ways that protect and improve our environment will be essential. And therefore, we will be launching, as, as Hammersmith and Fulham did two years ago, our, we launched our commitment to uh, confirm that we will rise to the climate emergency, that uh, we will become carbon neutral as a borough by the end of this decade. Um, and these are big, bold ambitions. But for those ambitions to be realized, we need to get everyone committed to it. And what I'm hoping is this week is that many of the ideas that are in our climate change strategy that are being worked up with a variety of different community groups and commissions and residence groups, all of those ideas will begin to be put into a very clear roadmap that adds to the work that we're already doing. And we already are doing so much. The new civic campus you see in much of our literature will be one of the greenest buildings anywhere on planet Earth. Um, um, 
we are introducing new energy schemes for all our housing. So looking at solar panels and all our council housing. We're talking to developers and, and people we buy contracts, uh, contract services from about what they do to help us meet our collective aim to become carbon neutral. Um, we're changing the way we transport with new cycle lanes and bike lanes. We pioneered electric scooters. And although it can be seen as controversial, we've also pioneered more electric car charging bays than anywhere else. Because I believe if people are gonna use their cars, it's better they use cars that don't contribute to greenhouse gases. So these are the many things that we're doing, but we need more and we need rapid change to meet this bold goal. Meanwhile, we have an industrial strategy, the first of its kind industrial strategy for any council with Imperial College London. Imperial College London is the eighth best university in the world, according to figures. But in terms of STEM industries, in terms of science and technology, it is probably up there in the top three. And it struck me very clearly when I was the leader of the opposition that those great ideas, those Brit ideas developed here in Britain from people all around the world working in that amazing college could be and should be our economic growth. But that economic growth will only rise in the system we currently have to need. And the biggest need we have is around the environment and other challenges like pandemics. So our industrial strategy is designed to capture the ideas that come out of Imperial College London and turn them into businesses, businesses that make a difference, the smartest possible businesses based here in Hammersmith and Fulham. I'm therefore pleased to, that one of the first businesses I met was Aboria, who designed uh, a mesh made out of um, uh, biotech technology um, that sucks up CO, uh, um, um, CO2 and produces oxygen. In fact, one hectare of this mesh will, will produce 147 hectares, the equivalent of 147 hectares of oxygen and consume 147, equivalent of 147 hectares of CO2 produced by a rainforest. So that's how powerful that type of thing is. Imagine we had all our buildings clad in that. Imagine lampposts were clad in it. Imagine that uh, our home, it was seen as a decoration from the outside of our homes. We would turn cities like London into contributing positively to um, the environment rather than negatively as it currently does. And that's just one of the many ideas coming out of Imperial. And there are so many from biodegradable plastics to uh, other mechanisms that improve the quality of our air and suck out particulates. Technology will help, but we have to uh, buy it and use it, make it part of our lives. And that's where the way we live our life, the science and technology will merge. Now this week, what we want is practical plans. We want support. This is such a big challenge for us that we're not gonna be able to do it by ourselves. We've had the ideas brought forward with the Environment and Ecology Commission, which we're grateful for. And we'll soon be announcing an Environment Delivery Commission uh, led again by a resident um, to look at how we actually move at pace to become the greenest borough in Britain and shine a light of how things are meant to happen. And in the process, maybe change the world beginning with our bit of West London. Have a good week and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councillor Cowan. Absolutely delighted that you're able to open the session for us today. Thanks, pleasure. <laughs> So to begin some of our talks, I'd like to hand over to a colleague, Tim, working in the Climate Emergency Unit to give an introduction to buildings and net zero. Hi, thank you, Emily, and thank you, uh, Councillor Cowan, as well. Um, so yes, I'm the Clean Energy Leader working in the um, Climate and Emergency Team for the Council. And myself and my colleague, Rob, are just going to quickly talk about um, what some of the kind of high level things that we're doing to try and get our buildings to, to net zero in the light of this, this, this huge challenge we're all facing. Um, so I'm just going to very quickly set a bit of context. Um, firstly, I thought some of you will know this already and apologies to, to those who do, but I thought it'd just be very it'd be useful just to very quickly talk about what we mean when we say net zero. Um, fundamentally, we, we mean that um, our net greenhouse gas emissions from mainly from burning fossil fuels, but also from some other things too, um, must be reduced to zero after accounting for removals. And when I talk about removals, I mean, Councillor Cowan there was talking about that mesh from Imperial. 
Um, there are also things that potentially we can do, like like planting forests in in places kind of outside of cities. Um, but it's important to know that that the potential, while those, while those things are very exciting, they they can't um, remove the level of emissions we're producing now. So in order to get to net zero, we do have to reduce our emissions. We have to reduce the amount of fossil fuel we're using quite significantly, uh, probably by at least eighty percent uh, to be able to get to to net zero. So what does this mean for buildings? Um, the usual definition that people use comes from an organization called the World Green Building Council. Um, and they, they define it as a highly energy efficient building with all remaining energy from on-site and or off-site renewable sources. So basically a building that uses as little energy as possible to do what a building needs to do and perform its function um, and then gets its remaining energy from, from renewable sources. Uh, we also should consider, I think, as well, and this is something that is kind of a more emerging area of interest, but the emissions created when buildings are constructed as well. And I'll say a bit more about that in a second. Uh, next slide, please, Emily. Um, so what do we need to do to get our buildings to net zero? Um, kind of, there's, there's kind of two big challenges here. The first is reduce what, what people tend to call the operational emissions of that building. So that means the, the energy, the mainly gas and electricity that building uses to keep warm or to air condition, be air conditioned or to light itself. Uh, we need to get that, that demand, that energy demand down as low as we can whilst enabling the building to, to do what, what the building, you know, to be an office building or be a school or whatever that building is doing or be a home. Um, the, the kind of points under there, under that reduced demand, I'll talk a bit more about in a second because I'm conscious I haven't got a huge amount of time. Um, and then we need to get the remaining energy that building uses from renewables. And that largely means moving away from gas because gas can never be renewable, it's a fossil fuel. So we need to get away from using gas for heat and start using electricity as well. And then that point on the right there, and this is something the GLA are doing quite a bit of work on at the moment, we need to do more to measure and disclose the energy used by buildings as well. Quite often people will go along and they will they will work on, they will retrofit an existing building to be more efficient, or they will create a new building that they claim is, is net zero carbon, but they won't then measure and verify that that building is, is doing what it's supposed to be doing. So that's a very important step as well. Uh, next slide, please, Emily. Um, and then at that point, I talked about um, embodied carbon as well. This this means the the carbon emissions that are produced when buildings are constructed. So think about, you know, those huge building sites you walk past perhaps sometimes on your commute when you, you know, they're building a new office building or a new block of flats or whatever it may be. Um, that is reckoned to it depends on the building and what it's used for and what it's made from but it probably accounts for about a third um, of the total carbon from the life cycle of the building, just kind of building, making that building in the first place. And the biggest chunk of that um, often comes from uh, concrete and cement. So the picture there I chose to put on is, is of a cement kiln. Um, and that's, that's kind of a, a really big part of the environmental impact of our buildings and something we, we are thinking, starting to think about now, what can we do to, um, make the, these embodied emissions lower? Can we, can we substitute concrete for materials like wood? Can we make concrete, the process of making concrete cleaner? Can we use recycled steel instead of um, virgin steel? Or can we reuse buildings more rather than tearing them down and putting new ones in their place? Uh, next slide, please, Emily. Um, so what does this mean for us in, in, in Hammersmith and Fulham? And I think the so kind of going back to thinking about making buildings as efficient as possible and using as little energy as possible. For us, we're a very densely developed inner city borough. Um, most of the buildings that are going to be around later this century are already there. So I think the biggest single challenge for us to get our buildings to net zero is to retrofit our existing buildings. Um, we have lots of quite historic buildings, quite a few listed buildings. Um, we don't want to kind of um, damage the appearance of those buildings too much, but at the same time, we need to look at these, these existing buildings, these blocks of flats, these houses, these office buildings, these schools as a system and get them to net zero. So when we say kind of build, you'll, you'll hear people talk about building retrofit a lot, and that will mean looking at the, the walls of the building, the insulation, the roof, the heating systems, the windows, looking at that whole building as a system, the lighting and getting it to be as efficient as possible. I've already talked about replacing gas. 
um, with zero carbon heat. And that is likely, I think, for us to largely mean moving to electric heat pumps, which take effectively take heat from the ground or from the air outside and then move that heat into the building. Uh, we should also think about the water used by buildings as well. And we should think about adapting them for future climate change as well. We don't want to retrofit our existing buildings and then create a problem where all those buildings are overheating in 50 years time. So we need to make sure they're um, comfortable to live in, 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 in kind of worsening future heat waves. Um, some of you might have heard about the huge heat waves they're having in Western Canada and the Western US at the moment, which is just breaking all known records uh, by, by a mile, um, just completely unprecedented for that part of the world. And that we're going to get more and more of that kind of thing. Um, the other two points, new buildings and renewable energy, they're also important. New, we, we want new buildings to be zero carbon at the point of construction. We don't want to go back and have to retrofit them. Uh, and then we want all the energy we use to be as, as near renewable as we can. So we want more renewable energy within the borough. Um, so the, so the uh, photovoltaics, PV, for instance. But we will also probably need to get renewable electricity in via the grid from outside the borough as well, again, because we're a dense urban borough, we don't have lots of space for um, solar farms or wind farms. So we are going to need to put, to get energy in from outside the borough too. And we're thinking about how to do that in a clean way. Um, next slide, please, Emily. So I'm going to hand over now to Rob, hopefully. He was having some internet issues, but hopefully he's okay to talk a little bit about some of the things we're starting to do and some of the things we would like to do in future to get, our, get the buildings in the borough to net zero. Brilliant. Thanks, Tim. Um, can I just check you can hear me okay? My internet seems okay? Yes, yeah, you're fine. All right, fantastic. <clears throat> uh, and hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Rob Kyle. I'm the project manager in the climate team. And as Tim mentioned, I'm here just to talk about what we're currently doing, where we are uh, in our journey uh, at Hammersmith and Fulham of getting us uh, to kind of zero carbon, as, as Councillor Cohen mentioned. Um, so first of all, let's talk about kind of what we have to do to get there as a council. So um, the council obviously has its own direct emissions. There's quite a lot of them. We need to ensure that we're getting them to zero carbon as soon as possible. So one of the first things we're doing is looking at our own corporate stock. So the buildings that the council owns um, and Tim's working with uh, the Greater London Authority, a retrofit accelerator to develop plans and then uh, work with um, contractors to have energy efficient contracts that, that basically uh, save us energy, save us money and, and pay back uh, the cost of those works. So he's working with the Greater London Authority on that. Um, we're looking at sourcing renewable energy. So we do have uh, green energy for our electricity as a council at the moment. But as Tim mentioned, we need to look at where we can get solar from, uh, wind energy from. So we're looking at ways that we can invest in solar farms and wind farms to, to bring in 100% renewable energy for the council. Um, Councillor Cohen's um, talked about uh, Civic Campus, and I'll come on to talk a bit more about that in a later slide um, and obviously we need to take advantage of the support from central government it's it is quite an expensive process getting to net zero net zero carbon so um, we're working with the central government to to get government grants and again i'll come on to a project that we're working on a bit later on and um, tim's talks about embodied, embodied carbon a lot as well and that's something that we really need to lead on as a council we need to make sure that the Built our buildings and, and our new developments are as low carbon as possible and understanding the carbon that's in the materials that, that constructs those buildings is, is really fundamental. So we need to be leading by example on that. And then finally, um, our social housing, which accounts for 35% of the council's own emissions. And if you take away the, the services that we buy, the services that we procure, it accounts for close to 70% of our emissions. So it's, it's a huge area that we need to focus on our social housing. And Emily, if you could just move on to the next slide, thank you. So I, sh I should say that in the past, our asset management team have been working on upgrading our social housing properties. A lot of you may have, have heard of um, insulation that Tim mentioned earlier, cavity wall insulation, upgrading windows to get double glazing, upgrading doors. And our stock is, is has been coming, been becoming progressively more efficient over the last 20 years or so. And, and a lot of our buildings are at energy performance rating D or C, which is which is quite positive. But really, we need to make more progress on that, as I've mentioned, up to 70% of our emissions can come from come from the, our social housing. So we've got to explore projects that effectively make that, that, that housing zero carbon. And one of those projects that we are doing at the moment and that we've committed to as a council is called Energy Sprung. Um, and this effectively retrofits a house to a net positive uh, standard of carbon. So I'm not sure if you can see on the right hand side there, we've got a, we've got a photo, um, we've got a before and after photo, which shows 
the amount of heating and hot water and how much energy appliances use to to give you the amount of energy uh, per year that a house may use. Once you use the energy sprung approach, approach you reduce that heating and hot water, you reduce you reduce the appliance use, and you generate uh, renewable energy. So it actually becomes uh, positive carbon. You put more renewable energy back into the electricity grid than you actually use as the house. So that's what the energy sprung um, approach is, and it includes things like uh, insulation, new windows, doors, air source heat pumps, which you'll hear a lot about today, uh, effectively uh, electronically heating the property. Um, solar panels, which a lot of you may know about, and, and potentially battery storage as well. So using the, using the um, solar panels energy, we can store that battery power for later, um, so they can use it in the evenings when the sun's not shining. And the goal of this is to, is to really reduce emissions by up to 80%. Um, and as I say, you can then add on the renewable energy to make it positive carbon. And this also results in a healthier and more comfortable home for the tenants living in these properties. So you can imagine especially kind of elderly people during the winter, you've got drafty, colder homes. And when you upgrade the properties to, to the energy sprung standard, they're gonna be much warmer, much more comfortable to live in, less risk of health issues in the future. So we're really, really excited to say that we're actually piloting, piloting this approach on 28 housing, 28 houses in the West Kensington estate. Um, really, really exciting project that's beginning. Uh, we're gonna break ground hopefully in October this year. Um, massively strategic as i said we're doing a lot on our stock already but really we need to go further and, and this project's going to help drive down the cost of the approach because it is still quite a costly approach to get to that uh, positive carbon standard um, so we've got to drive down the costs we want to develop our knowledge of retrofit because again it is quite a a new area this whole house retrofit that we're looking at um, we want to develop our knowledge in the council and obviously we want to build partnerships we want to work with new suppliers on the market to to make sure that you know that we we know and they know how to do it in the best way possible, that's most um, cost cost efficient as well. And as I mentioned, we're going to talk. Uh, the, the leaders talked a lot about in the civic campus already, so I won't spend too much time on it. But effectively, we will have, I'd say, kind of a market leading ground source heat pump, and this is where we take heat from the ground and we use that to heat the building. Um, obviously, it's quite a big building, so it's going to be a very big ground source heat pump that we that we install there um, and, and that's a really exciting project for the council um, using electricity to using the heat from the ground um, to then heat the building is is far more energy efficient um, and I think as Tim mentioned the electricity grid is just getting more and more um, uh, or it's getting less and less carbon intensive sorry I should say um, with with more wind farms more solar panels um, being built every day. So the, the town halls also reached a BREEAM standard of, of very good, which is really an unbelievable achievement for a listed building of its type. Um, so we're really excited about that. We're going to have solar panels. There'll be energy efficient lighting, rain, rainwater, rainwater harvesting. Um, so taking all the rainwater and using that for, for toilets um, will, will be one of the, another key initiative. There'll be solar shading. Um, if there is a, there is a, a challenge of when, buildings heat up too much. Obviously there's a lot of sun as we know things are getting just hotter and hotter. We have to make sure that the building doesn't overheat. So that's been built into the design as well. And then the, we've got an advanced building management system which will effectively which will effectively be uh, a system that will manage the each room within the within the building um, and will only heat up when participants go into the room. So um, obviously we're saving energy by making sure that that room is not heated all day long, all night long. And then we've, we've talked about Boyer Solar Leaf, um, that we're really excited that this could be one of the first destinations to have a solar leaf. Um, and as Councillor Cohen said, that's, that's a really exciting technology. We need to drive innovation within a lot of the council activities and, and that will be a key one. I mean, fantastic whether we're looking at ground source heat pumps, solar panels, that, that's, that's quite a common technology now, but the solar leaf is, is really exciting. Um, and what else are we doing in the borough? So we're, we're, we are obviously having to uh, lead action in the wider borough as well. We've got a goal for the whole borough. So we're working with private housing. My colleague Jess will come on to talk a bit more about that, but um, supporting houses with, um, with government funding um, and also kind of helping them with understand all the energy usage so they can reduce it as much as possible. And um, working with businesses um, and commercial buildings. So again, advising them of, of what the government regulations are at the moment, but we're also hoping to develop something called a climate alliance where we work with businesses to 
um, to support them develop climate goals. We're also looking at developing clean heat networks. Um, so rather than having an individual boiler or individual air source heat pump for each property, we have networks of heat that, that, that are much more energy efficient um, and, and don't require um, nearly as many uh, emissions to, to run. We're also uh, working with the planning team to develop uh, planning frameworks for net zero carbon buildings and our new infrastructure and major, major refurbishments, which is obviously which is obviously fundamental. Having those advanced net zero planning frameworks is, is going to be key for our new developments, making sure that we design and build um, our, our new constructions to the highest level of energy efficiency as possible. And I believe, Emily, is that the last slide? Yes, I'm going to hand back to Emily um, to introduce Debbie. Thank you very much, Tim and Rob. So huge amount of information there. So definitely ask any questions you've got in, in the chat and we'll hopefully have 15 minutes at the end um, for you to ask any of the speakers. So please do ask questions throughout. But absolutely delighted now to introduce Debbie, um, Deputy Chief Exec at Urban Partnership Group to talk about UPG's eco journey and making the Masbro Centre run on sunshine. Thank you so much, Emily, and um, thank you very much to the Council for inviting me to speak today. Um, as Emily said, I am the Deputy CEO of the Urban Partnership Group in Hammersmith and Fulham. Emily, could I have the next slide? So just a little bit about what we do. Um, we, the Urban Partnership Group, run services out of six community centres, mainly in central and north area of the borough. Um, we have uh, nurseries free um, for under twos. We have children's centres, um, outreach support for families, parenting support, youth clubs, adult education, employment advice, and elders activities and befriending service. Um, the centres that we run out of, I'm, I'm hoping you know some of them, is the Masbro Centre, Edward Woods Community Centre, White City Community Centre, Chaircroft, Brook Green and Flora Gardens. Um, we have, hold the lease on two of those properties. Um, this is through the Asset Transfer Initiative from the Council and that is the Masbro Community Centre and Edward Woods Community Centre. And I've invited um, along today to talk a little bit about our, our eco journey. I'm coming to the next slide, please, Emily. So um, back in 2018, um, the City Bridge Trust invited charities um, to apply for funding to have an eco audit done to them. Um, and this was a way where a, a, a eco specialist would come in and assess our properties, our ways of working, and see how we could improve the way that we did things to be a more environmentally responsible organization. Um, that was a really interesting, quite grueling um, experience. And it was uh, undertaken by a gentleman called Donica McCarthy and any of you involved in environmental work probably, probably know about him. Um, he provided us, um, he examined all our areas of the practice, um, what we used, what we threw away, what we bought, um, how we purchased, how we powered our organisations, even who we did our banking with, um, to ensure that we were making good positive choices as an organisation. Um, the results gave us a plan of action and one of the, the key things um, that was recommended to us was putting solar panels on the roof of the Masbro Centre. Um, we have some good flat roof <laughs> um, uh, that, that could, could take it and would provide us with not only green energy, but would uh, uh, reduce restrictions on funds that we have to be more responsive to community, to be more responsive to community needs. Um, we anticipated that we would save you know, about 20,000 kilowatt hours. Sorry, we would generate about 20,000 kilowatt hours uh, per year. Um, and as I said, the money saved would be used to, for community projects. We're a charity, every penny counts. Um, and most of that, the money we do have is tied to do specific activities and, and provide specific deliverables. And this way gave us um, some money 
um, would enable us to release money to be used, to be flexible and be more agile um, with some of our community projects. Um, one of the other really key outputs of the eco audit was Donica developed um, uh, an eco tips workshop for people on low income households. Um, the this this was really important. Most of our service users are from low income households and often talking to people about how you know solar panels you know installing solar panels or installing new boilers is just just not on their radar at all but really um developed this um excellent workshop around food waste around who you have your utilities with day-to-day -day activities that you can do to have an impact um on, on the climate emergency um re reduction of single use anything um and he, he gave some really excellent um, pragmatic solutions for people on, on low income households. He then taught our staff how to deliver that workshop and that was a programme we had started um, uh, pre-COVID. So I just want to move on if we can, Emily. Thank you. So obviously the planning to go solar is not cheap. Um, and as an organisation, <clears throat> Um, we, we could put some money towards it, but we couldn't put all the money towards it. Um, Capredi at um, Hammersmith and Fulham Council suggested we use a Space Hive uh, platform, which is a crowdsourcing platform, which uh, the councils um, work with um, to, to raise the funds for this community project. And what the council wanted to see was that we had sufficient uh, support from the community before they would put in their um, pound notes as well. And um, we were very grateful they put in 20,000 of those pound notes towards our, our project. But we also got um, we also got 180 individual backers from the community putting in anything from two pounds onwards saying, yes, we think this is a useful thing to do. We, we, we think this is a good project for our community. We also sourced some money from London Community Energy Fund. Um, there's a Nature Save Trust, there's DPD Green Funds. There are lots of small funds out there for community green projects, whether that's redeveloping a, um, a, a community garden space um, or whether, whether it's about solar panels or whether it's about putting in composting systems, et cetera. So I, you know, I would urge you um, to look around. Um, a point I forgot to mention on my previous slide was about uh, uh, kind of working with people who know about this stuff. Um, there are some really, really passionate people out there who are out there to help. And I had put some on my previous slide that these will be available afterwards. So, um, and there is lots of uh, tools and free tools and advice on um, online. Um, that, that you can access and, and we did as well. Um, <clears throat> so over from about November 2019 to uh, end of January 2020, we ran the crowdsourcing campaign um, for Make, the, Make Masbro Run on Sunshine. We raised the money. Um, we were absolutely delighted and quite shocked. Um, and then installation happened pretty quickly, pretty easily. We had all our planning in place beforehand. Um, and uh, the installation took a matter of weeks and we were plugged in and generating our own electricity um, by the end of February. And we planned a big community party mid-March 2020 to say thank you to the community. Um, and as you know, March 2020 for any kind of celebration was absolutely a no-no. So that, that's still very much on on hold, but it, this was very much a community um, achievement. Can I have the next slide, please, Emily? Um, so, so far um, at Masbro, we've uh, generated, I checked the meter the other day, we've generated over 25,000 uh, kilowatts of green electricity. Um, that has saved us around six and a half thousand pounds, which has been great this year because we've been running emergency food distribution during the COVID pandemic and we've had very little funding for that and we've been able to use that you know we've been able to earmark that money to deliver that community project. Um, we were so delighted with ourselves um, that we decided to do it again um, at the Edward Woods Community <laughs> Centre um, and I was very hesitant about doing crowdsourcing again 
people have got, I felt, had got bigger fish to fry this year than worrying about solar panels on top of another community centre. But I was very wrong. We got um, 107, currently I think we've got about 107, 108 backers for that project. Um, we are, and the council, again, very generously on Friday gave us £20,000 towards that project. So we're 99% of the way there to raising our funds with three days left to go. We've got 750 quid left to raise. The link is on the slide there. If anybody fancies bunging in a fiver before Thursday, we'd be delighted. Um, what I would say is that uh, COVID put a bit of a kibosh on a lot of our plans that we had made as a, as a, as a result of our um, eco audit. Uh, one of the big things, because we deal with so many people in the normal course of the day over our many centres, we, we weren't good in terms of our use of single use plastics, etc. We met, we got away from that. Um, and then COVID pushed us right back into single, single use, um, the use of single use plastics. And it's not just single use plastics, it's single use anything should be, avoid, should be avoided. So um, we're working out how we now manage in a COVID environment to be, um, to be as ecologically friendly as we can be while protecting um, our service users and our staff. So we currently now, um, reviewing our business plans from 2022 to 2025 about how we properly embed our green policies within our working practices so we don't get derailed by covid or anything else we have a plan of action um, that's embedded within our business plan and our trustees can hold us accountable um, for those and we we want to work with the council to to also become um, zero carbon emissions by 2030 and I think we're making good headway in doing that um, and we're happy to share our experiences with any other community organizations out there that, that want to talk to us and help the council in any way we can and continue continue to spread the word so I think that's me I think I've rambled on for 10 minutes now. <laughs> <laughs> That's fab. Thank you so much, Debbie. It's such a brilliant story. And I, I'm sure if I can ask my colleague Simone to share the link to Space Hive, um, if anyone wants to put in a couple of pounds between now or share with, with colleagues, um, that would be brilliant. But thanks for coming along, Debbie. And now to introduce um, Brian, who's a local resident in Hammersmith and Fulham, to talk about his personal experience of getting his home to carbon neutral. So over to you, Brian. Okay, so uh, yeah, could you go on to the next slide then, please, Emily? So the challenge was, as a result of uh, uh, realizing that in about 30, 40 years time, there probably wouldn't be a London if we didn't start changing our processes. My wife and I decided to see if we could get our Edwardian, very narrow Edwardian terraced house to be carbon neutral and to prove A, that it could be done. And then having proved it, to really start to put it out there that it is possible and, uh, and that it can be spread throughout, well, throughout the country really. Our house had already had a, uh, a loft conversion done. So we had two flat roofs. Uh, it's double glazed at the back and uh, uh, secondary glazed on the two front bay windows. And uh, we'd closed off our fireplaces, which are a great source of drafts. And we also had a high pressure water supply into the house. That was already in place. But what I realized was that actually if we were going to do this, it, we had to look at it from a holistic point of view. Uh, in other words, if we were going to generate electricity, there had to be as much of it as we possibly could get in order to drive one of the alternative sources of heat for the house itself. And what I discovered was, was that obviously solar panels are, are the most obvious approach, is that most solar panel installers were really only interested in coming in slapping up seven or eight or nine panels on the roof and then disappearing because it was easy. And actually what I realized was, was that I wanted as much electricity 
out of the roof as I could possibly get. And that entailed having panels that were facing north on a north facing roof. Go to the next slide, Emily, would you? Uh, so there are the first element of this pathway is to get yourself a green energy supplier. And there's a number of them out there that pledge that their sources are wind, solar, hydro, a bit of nuclear. And in other words, no fossil fuels whatsoever. We're with Octopus and they seem to work extremely well. They will also fit for you a smart meter. And this is very interesting because you begin to discover how much energy you waste. Uh, but it also is essential when it comes to upgrading your systems. Uh, as I mentioned, with window glazing, we have secondary glazing in the front, which is extremely effective, I might say, and very inexpensive, acrylic magnetic secondary glazing, and double glazed at the back, which faces west. Uh, and the roof, the roofs are all extremely well insulated, especially the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the loft extension, because it has to fit building rigs. And closing up your chimney, chimneys makes a large difference to the amount of air that passes through the house, especially when there's a strong northerly or easterly blowing in the winter. So uh, let's, so we've got two elements really solar panels to generate electricity and how to replace the gas boiler because the gas boiler creates a huge amount of uh, carbon dioxide emissions. So could you go to the next slide then? So looking at solar panels, as I said, we had a, I had a real problem trying to find a, a, a company that would take on the vision that I had. Uh, we've ended up with just one panel that faces south. There are two that fa face east and those are on the, this is the photograph here on the left hand side is to the back of the house. Uh, but there's an equal, almost equal number on the, on the front of the house. So there's one panel facing south, two panels facing east, that's on the sloping front roof. There's 11 on the loft conversion flat roofs and there's six facing north. Now people, these installers, so there's no point putting them on facing north, but I can tell you from the, between the two equinoxes, those north facing panels produce almost as much electricity as the flat roof panels. And uh, so sticking with your vision of wanting to get as much electricity out of the roof as possible ac is actually worth it. And each panel only costs 85 quid. To have the panel installed is about 270. So if you're paying for scaffolding and the blokes to be there to do the job, it makes no sense not to get as much pa many panels up there as you can get. The electricity then goes down, and this and there's another very important element about this, and that is because they face in many different directions, you must use the end phase. Um, converters that are put onto each panel so that no panel affects any other panel. Um, most installation companies put them in series and it is a disaster when you've got panels facing in numerous directions. Um, that electricity is then DC because it's already converted uh, from and comes down into our electricity cupboard. And we have 9.6 kilowatts of batteries there, as you can see in the middle uh, photograph. And in that same electricity cupboard is the most remarkable, uh, it's made by a Chinese company called SoFar. It's an inverter that distributes electricity either to the house, to the solar, to the batteries or into the grid and also allows electricity to come from the grid to drive the house when we need it. So uh, let's walk, move then over to the air source heat pump. The, uh, the became evident that an air source heat pump was the only way that in a narrow house that you could replace the gas boiler. Now, this is a technology that has transformed over the last five years or so. Traditionally, they only were, could only any good on uh, um, underfloor heating or massive great radiators that had to be replaced. And that is staggeringly expensive. 
we have fitted an, uh, the very latest Valent. It's a 12 kilowatt uh, air source heat pump. It's not small, but it's not ugly. And uh, it's, uh, uh, it's called the uh, Valent Aerotherm Plus. And uh, it, it converts the heat from the air, and it, it's too complicated to explain, but you look it up, how they work. This is a remarkable piece of kit. And uh, it, um, uh, the heat goes from the air source heat pump into a large buffer tank that is then distributed. The heat from that is distributed via a heat exchanger, which is a small box inside the house where the old gas boiler used to be. And when it was really cold in March, because March, we didn't get this in until February, uh, in March, uh, which was really cold, it very easily kept the whole house warm, including the top of the house uh, where we have a tenant and uh, it was, she were, is working from home. So it was on all day long uh, and it worked extremely well when it was minus two, minus three degrees outside. So the lessons that you learn, that we can learn from this are that you need to do some research if you're intending to do this. It is not cheap, but uh, Finding the right installers is critical. Uh, find reputable suppliers. Uh, there are the two that we used. I spent a lot of time working with them because most companies are not set up to do what I was wanted to do. The renewable heat incentive. There's a few companies that are able to use this grant. Essentially, it's not a grant. It's a payback schemes by central government, where over seven, year, over seven years, uh, they will replace a little more than 90% of your capital investment in getting the air source heat pump fitted, paid for and installed. Uh, apparently, these more available grants are available now through Hammersmith and Fulham. Essentially, we paid entirely for the uh, um, the batteries and the solar panels, but we did get a, 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 a grant from the renewable heat incentive, which is now being paid. And just recently, we got our first payment. There is a, uh, a document that I've written called Pathway to a Net Zero Home. It is possible, and it is my objective over the course of the next few years to put this out there so that I can encourage many other private owners of their homes to do this but it would be useful to get some money some financial help because it is not cheap <laughs> thank you very much thank, thank you me. very much for sharing your story there brian and if anyone would like a copy of that document please email us and we're happy to share that on his behalf we've got one more lightning speaker which is our colleague jess who is going to try and shorten her section a wee bit so that we can um, get in a few questions towards the end there. So please do keep asking your questions. We'll hand over to Jess and then we'll try and get through as many as we can before one o'clock. Thanks, Emily. Okay, so whistle stop tour of uh, all the schemes available for residents in the borough. Um, so first up, we have the Green Homes Grants Local Authority Delivery Scheme and Hammersmith and Fulham Council have won some funding to give away to uh, residents who are eligible to get some retrofit works done on their house. Um, so if you have a household annual income of less than 30,000, and additionally, if you also have up to 20,000 pounds in housing benefits, um, along with living in a property that has an EPC rating of D or below, I'd strongly encourage you to um, apply. So the amount of funding that you get is dependent on your tenure. So if you are a property owner or if you are, sorry, if you're a property owner, then you can get up to 100% of the measures funded up to the value of £10,000. And if you're a tenant, that's private or social tenant, um, then you can get up to 66% of your uh, measures funded up to the value of £5,000. And it's expected that the landlord will make the contribution, contribution for the remaining um, one third of um, funding. So next slide, please, Emily. Um, so I just wanted to show you really quickly some of the measures that are available through this scheme. So most of it is insulation. So that's external, internal wall insulation, underfloor insulation. Um, and then there's other sorts of um, heating. So there's 
uh, air source heat pumps and solar PV um, and other things like double glazing windows, draft proofing and low energy lighting. And I just wanted to emphasize that this is a grant, so we're not expecting you to repay any of this and the council's already appointed all the installers. So it is a really simple process. All you have to do is call through to, um, to an organization called Green Doctors, um, who I'll, I'll have the details later on in this segment. So next slide. Thanks, Emily. Um, so another scheme that we have at the moment is called the Energy Company Obligation. Uh, ECO for short, which is uh, another government scheme that's actually run through energy suppliers. So the measures that are offered for this one is quite similar to the Green Homes Grant. You've got insulation um, and other types of heating, but this one also includes first time central heating for those that currently don't have any. Um, and again, the eligibility criteria is based upon your tenure. So if you are a private homeowner or a private tenant, then it's means tested benefits for the main scheme. And for social tenants, it's a EPC rating of E, F and G. Um, and then recently within the council, we've just opened up a new pathway called flexible eligibility, which builds upon the existing eligibility criteria, making it more accessible to lots of different households so they can get access to this funding. And next slide, please, Emily. So I just wanted to show you the page where you can find all of these details. So it's on the Energy Initiatives page. And if you could just play the video, please, Emily, thanks. So you've got the eco information there. In order to find the eligibility criteria, um, if you just scroll down to where it's just slightly above the table, you've got the statement of intent, you can check through there. And if you are eligible, then here's a list of all of the different installers that have been approved and you can call through to them um, to get access to the funding. And I just also want to show you that the Green Homes Grant information is also just on that page, just below the eco information as well. Um, and then finally, the last scheme that I wanted to touch upon is um, something that Brian spoke about earlier, um, which is the Domestic Renewable Heat Incentive. It's only available to um, private homeowners, unfortunately, or landlords. Um, and so if you're thinking of getting a heating system uh, that might be eligible under this scheme, uh, I strongly go, I encourage you to go to the Ofgem website to check because it can provide financial support in the form of payments um, for over seven years. So, yep. And then next slide, please, Emily. So, yeah, here's how to apply and all of the um, additional information. So for the Green Homes Grant, um, contact Green Doctors to be screened. Even if you're not sure you're going to be eligible, I'd still say call anyway just to double check. Um, for the energy company obligation, check our energy initiatives page. And then for the renewable heat incentive, just check the Ofgem website for some of the guidance on how to apply. Thanks, Emily. Hopefully that's quick enough. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jess, and we will make all these slides available afterwards. So I know we only have four minutes left, so I wonder if Simone, if you want to pick out two or three questions that we can ask our speakers, and we will follow up with answers to all questions in the chat afterwards as well. Thank you, Emily. So I think one of the best questions we had is, is there a one-stop point of contact where anybody completing works or repairs can go to get started? And I think the website, Jess, um, talked about would be a great start. Um, so I don't know if Jess, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, definitely go on there to check whether or not you're a um, private tenant, homeowner or social tenant, there's always something there. And um, if not, then you can always call through to Green Doctors who have schemes that they have access to and can put you on waiting lists and let you know what's available at the moment. Great, thank you. Um, and then another question for the climate team. Um, does planning allow solar panels in a conservation area? And that, can this info be added to the Hammersmith and Dillon website? Tim, do you want to take that question? I know this is something that um, is often a barrier to installing solar PV in conservation areas. Um, I believe that it should be possible to install solar PV on aspects that don't face the street. Um, but I am not 100% sure exactly what our, our rules are on that, but we are currently um, opening up a conversation with the GLA, who I understand have done some work looking at um, what London boroughs could do to facilitate solar PV in conservation areas and trying to get more of a common approach going across London, because I think at the moment there's kind of some um, discrepancies between boroughs on this. So this is something that we want to look at and try and work out, you know, what can we do 
to facilitate solar PV in conservation areas without obviously damaging the historic um, structure of our buildings. So I think there'll be more to come on that in, in, in future. Anyone else got anything to add on that? No, uh, it's Debbie um, at Masbro. Masbro Centre is in a conservation area. Um, and we managed to get permission. We got really good advice actually from the council, the planning department really helpful and we had to adjust our design slightly and it did take a bit of time to get through, but, but we got it through. We've got 64 panels up there on a flat roof. Good to hear, that's good news, thank you. Um, we've got another question about homes in conservation areas um, that have limited or are prevented from having external changes. Um, I think I can yeah. go to Brian and ask if your pathway to net zero home document can be applied to homes such as these. Uh, you're talking about conservation homes because our, our little patch in, in uh, sort of northwest Shepherd's Bush isn't a conservation area. So I didn't have to go through the process. So I actually wouldn't know, to be quite honest. I'll, I'll just jump in there. I think um, Brendan's mentioned his concern around, you know, government's going to bring in legislation that, that say you have to have an, a particular type of energy efficiency for the house. I would say that there will be exemptions in that legislation if they, they bring it out. I'd be absolutely shocked if uh, that wasn't the case, because for homes that are 150 years old, it is going to be very challenging. And that is part of the, the journey that we're going on at the moment is that we're, we're working on new technologies, working with companies to develop new approaches that that are cost efficient, that address um, challenging homes that are in, you know, that have single glazed um, uh, original windows with no cavities. I mean, we've talked about internal wall insulation. It looks like it's even challenging there. So we've got to we've got to come up with new ways. And I think that that links to I think Peter's question and um, Ian's question about you know what else are we doing at the moment? And I th maybe I didn't say it clear enough in our initial in my initial presentations that we have been retrofitting in the council. Um, just not to the extent that we're looking at now. We've been doing lots of windows, doors, uh, cavity walls throughout our stock. Um, now we're, we're definitely moving on to a different level. We're, we're looking at whole house retrofit where we, we try and reduce the emissions as much as possible. But we are at the beginning of, of the journey for that. And, and as, as Brian said, a, a lot of people are at the beginning of the journey for that. There's not a huge amount of companies out there that are addressing this type of stuff at the moment. So the council as Councillor Cohen mentioned, has a climate strategy. What we're also developing alongside that now is a, a retrofit plan. So that will develop a plan to come up with um, options for things like the Edward Woods estate that Ian's mentioned um, to explore whether ground source heat pumps will be plausible there. Um, also, sorry, I, I know we're going over slightly over time, but someone, I think someone mentioned why aren't we kind of installing heat pumps and are heat pumps the right technology for buildings? And that, that's a really good that's a really good point. Um, the, the technology isn't, maybe quite as good as it could be. Um, I think it's getting better and better. But what we, we do know is that we need to we need to take a fabric first approach and, and that includes retrofitting our buildings with insulation, with windows, before those heat pumps can be used. So the re one of the reasons that the council hasn't rolled out a lot of heat pumps at the moment is because we're still making sure that the buildings are operating correctly um, using the least amount of energy possible just from those insulation measures. Um, heat pumps will come after that. And then obviously we need, we need to check on things like the noise, the size of the of the technology. So I, I would say that, as I mentioned, we're at the beginning of a journey, but we're moving very, very quickly towards um, getting our stock to, to net zero. And we've got nine, eight, nine years to do it. Um, Councillor Cohen's mentioned being committed. We've got, uh, someone's asked the question of, of how much money we're going to spend on it. I, I, I don't think I can divulge that information here at the moment, but I would say that the council is certainly um, agreeing on a big package at the moment to that will address the, the social housing element. Um, and hopefully through all our learning and um, through the continued progress that we're making um, as a council, we can begin to help private owners in the in the borough as well. Thank you very One much. One last quick question for you, Emily. Um, someone would like to know whether the session recording will be posted online. Yes, we hope to be uploading it to YouTube um, later in the week. And I'll follow up with an email and the slides to everyone. So I, I want to um, wrap up because I know people need to jump off. Um, a few quick links for you. It's London Climate Action Week and we have launched a map of all the brilliant things happening around our borough. So we'll share the link with you. Tell us what's missing, what you want to see on the map and what great things are you already aware of that are happening across the borough that are tackling the climate emergency. 
We've also started a new monthly newsletter. So if you'd like to sign up and see what the council's doing, hear community stories and hear what we're reading and sharing, then please do also sign up to our newsletter. And final plug for our four following events this week, join us every day at 12 o'clock to hear what we're doing in terms of travel, consumption, biodiversity and adaptation. I realize we, we definitely didn't have enough time for Q&A today. So our team email is there. Um, please feel free to, to reach out and contact me if you want to discuss anything um, or, and we'll follow up with answers to your questions as well. But thank you everyone so much for joining us today for the first event in London Climate Action Week. I hope you have a lovely week um, and yeah, look forward to, to seeing you at future events as well. Thanks for coming along.